Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today in this show with one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, immigration. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask your question. And one of our attorneys is going to be answering your question live and for free. So you don't get that very often. And please, if you see an attorney in a party or in a family meeting or something, please don't stop them to, to ask for legal stuff because they want to relax. They don't want to talk about this. So you have this space today. You don't have to pay for it. It's not a consultation. It's just a general orientation uh, for a case you may have. And if you need more information, you can call the phone number 216-279-3984 one six two seven nine three nine eight four today we have one of the most experienced attorneys in the law firm um uh, is the attorney robert Rat ratliff he has been an immigration judge and also i think a prosecutor if i'm not wrong um so he's going to be talking with us and giving us some uh details about what's going on with the immigration field at this point in the united states of america so let's welcome the attorney Robert. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Good afternoon, Juan Carlos. How are things down there? Uh, everything is good. It's getting a little cold here in Atlanta, but just very, very little. Nothing compared to Cleveland. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I would like to start today uh, talking about what's going on with the deportations, removals, uh, especially for people that have entered the United States in the last two or three years. Uh, without inspection or maybe surrender at the border, um, what happens with them and what happens to the removal orders that they have been given at the moment, uh, but some of them don't know because they never showed up at the court, or maybe they showed up, they didn't have an attorney because they didn't have the resources to hire an attorney, and now they have a removal order. What's going to happen with them, especially with this order from the uh, federal court in the uh, 10th circuit? Yeah, well, you know, it's an interesting question, and, and a lot of people get to the removal order in a lot of different ways. Uh, but the short answer is, is once you have that removal order, and what the 10th circuit decision talked about was how long you have to depart the United States after that removal order. But once you have that removal order in place, you do have to leave the United States unless you have an appeal pending. And if that removal order is final and you have not left the United States, there's there's a couple of things. One, you could be subject to being uh, arrested and detained by ICE. And I, ICE uh, in the current last couple of years has not been uh, aggressive in enforcing those removal orders. We've seen other administrations in the past that have been more aggressive in doing that. Uh, but if ICE wants to enforce that removal order, they can pick you up. They can place you in detention and keep you in detention until they uh, get you removed from the United States. And that can be a prolonged period of time. Uh, you cannot even ask for release from ICE custody uh, in that situation until you've been detained for 180 days uh, under the current law. So that, that can be a problem for you if you've got that removal order. Now, if you do have that removal order, there are some things that you can still think about depending on how you got to that removal order. As you mentioned, the people that had uh, what we call in absentia orders, those are orders that are entered by the court because you didn't show up. Based on why you didn't show up, or even just the fact that you didn't show up because you know you were scared, you may be able to ask the court to reopen your case and give you a chance to ask for relief in the form of asylum or any other forms of relief you may be entitled to. And, and it's a very liberal process. It's a process that has uh, uh, a lot of variety to it, that the judges have a lot of leeway in granting those kind of requests. And uh, it's, it's very doable. So if you do have that in absentia order, you definitely need to, to be aware that it, you, your, your case isn't over. It can still be reopened and you just need to consult with somebody to, to start that process. Okay. So, um, for example, for Venezuelan people, because 
and I am kind of embarrassed for what some Venezuelan people are doing right now in uh, states like New York, uh, Massachusetts, um, Columbia District. They are doing a lot of mess, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna defend some kind of Venezuelans. Um, but over uh, fifty thousand people, or over a hundred thousand people, have entered the United States in the last two years, uh, and I'm talking about Venezuelans. So what what happens if they are uh, in the United States? They have a removal order already, and now we have the TPS for people that enter in the United States before July the 31st this year. Can they still apply for TPS? Yeah, the short answer is yes. You can still apply for TPS, and how that's going to play out for you may be, may be in a couple of different ways. The TPS would allow you to uh, avoid removal. Even if you have that final removal order, you may be eligible to apply for uh, TPS and stay any removal order, which basically means uh, stop it from being enforced. You also may be in a position where you can go back to court and ask the court to reopen your removal order, whether it was in absentia or maybe you just, you know, you had an asylum case and, and you lost. Um, so the court can reconsider that based on the fact that the TPS program has now been extended with new dates, uh, new registration periods. So that's something that the court didn't have in front of it when your case was originally decided. So that may may provide a basis for you to go back to court and say, hey, can you reconsider my case in light of this new evidence? Okay, so, uh, well, this is a very interesting question, but they definitely uh, the short answer was yes, they can apply for the TPS. Mm -hmm. So if you need more information or if you want to apply or see if you qualify for this new TPS, you can call the phone number 216 Two seven nine three nine eight four two one six two seven nine three nine eight four. We have an employed employment based question. I have an H one B and my employer filed for I one forty, but what would happen if I lose my job? Well, it kind of depends on why you lost your job. If if you lost your job because the employer fired you for, you know, some nefarious reason, uh, it. it that may impact the I-140 and it may terminate it. If you lost your job because of layoffs or uh, because of other some other economic reason with the company, you may be able to transfer that uh, application to another employer. So it's it's going to just really depend on your specific circumstances. And I would I would definitely think you should uh, consult with an experienced employment-based attorney to look at that. Oftentimes, the, what people don't understand is when an employer does file an I-140 on your behalf, the attorney that's helping the employer do that, that attorney's job is to represent the employer, not necessarily the employee. So uh, you want to get your own attorney that can look at the situation and tell you what you can do and maybe help you navigate a process to get either a different employer or a different uh, type of sponsorship in the United States. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, well, Roshan, if you want more information, you can call the office. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. We have another question that says, are there changes in the 10-year the law? I think they are talking about the 10-year cancellation. Well, two, there's two things there that they could be talking about. One is the 10-year cancellation, and that's a program that if you've been in the United States for at least 10 years, if you have qualifying U.S. citizen or permanent resident relatives, children or parents or a spouse, and you can establish that it would be an exceptional or extremely unusual hardship to those qualifying relatives, you may have a path to uh, obtaining permanent residency. The other 10-year law is something that's a little bit more uh, uh, harsh on people. That 10-year law is that if you have been in the United States without status for more than a year, if you came uh, on any kind of a tourist visa, if you came with any kind of a uh, visa, even if you came without any kind of a, a entry document, and you leave after you've stayed in the United States for more than a year, you face a 10-year ban on reentry into the United States. 
So there has been no changes to that. That law has been in place for 20 odd years now. Um, and that's, that's still in play. So if you've been here for more than a year without status and you leave, you, uh, you face that 10 year ban on reentry. There are some waivers to it, but they're very, very limited. The, uh, other provision to that is if you have, if you did enter the United States without legal status and you stayed and you left and then came back, not only do you have that 10 year ban, but you have now something that's called a perm bar. And that perm bar means that uh, you're permanently barred from uh, many, many types of relief. There are very, very limited waivers to it. And there are um, uh, very limited options for somebody that comes in 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 that situation so uh the you know, the 10-year law either for the cancellation or the 10-year law for the uh, uh ban on re-entry they both have uh, both very complex and they both have a lot of ramifications for the people that suffer those penalties thank you so much attorney robert don't forget you can call the phone number 216-279-3984 216-279-3984. The office of Margaret W. Wong and Associates have seven locations across the country in Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, in Nashville, New York, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. And that's the phone number you can call. You can make your appointment. And then the attorney, Margaret W. Wong, will see you in one of the locations or other attorney in the law firm will take care of your uh, concerns and your questions. Um, let's go ahead and uh, read the next question. Good afternoon. My son was murdered four years ago in Atlanta. I didn't want to file nothing because I was devastated. Now I heard that I can file for a U visa. What are the requirements and can I still apply after four years? Yeah, the, the I'm sorry for for your loss. That's a that's a very tragic situation. Um, the the answer is yes. There there's not really a time limit on the U visa uh, after the event, but what the U visa does require is that you have been a victim of crime, that you have assisted or helped the authorities with the prosecution or investigation of that crime, and that the uh, local prosecutor or local police authorities sign a statement that says, yes, you've been a victim and you have cooperated in, in their investigations. Uh, once you have that signed document, then you can apply for a U visa. It's, uh, um, it's very straightforward. Um, once you have, the, the hard part is getting that signed document and documenting all the uh, uh, issues that, that occurred in your case. Uh, that U visa will be grant can be granted for a period of up to four years. You can adjust status to uh, permanent residency from a U visa, and uh, you do get work authorization uh, during that uh, process. The processing times for U visas right now are, are very lengthy. There is quite a backlog. Um, this was a program that's not been around very very long, uh, but there are uh, a, a lot of people that try to take advantage of the U visa program uh, that have suffered, you know, uh, tragic events or been the victims of crime. So yeah, the, don't worry about the four years so much. That's not as important as documenting the case and documenting uh, your participation in the investigation and the um, prosecution of whatever happened. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Robert. Don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984. It's the phone number that you need to call uh, to talk with one of the attorneys and set your appointment in the city that you are closer to. Um, we have more questions. The next one says, uh, high driving without a license is bad for TPS. Thank you. It's not good. Uh, and once you get to TPS, get the work authorization and you can get a, a valid license. Um, but just driving without a license uh, by itself is not necessarily the worst, uh, worst offense. It will not necessarily uh, vacate your, your TPS status. Uh, you still shouldn't do it, but um, you can survive it if you do get caught driving without a license. You can, uh, um, you can continue in that status. Um, it's when you have things that add on to that driving without a license. Don't drink and drive without a license. Uh, 
uh, don't commit other crimes and drive without a license. Um, it goes to the total uh, package of a review of your good moral character. Should you be able to get out of TPS into a different type of uh, more permanent visa? So uh, short answer is it's not going to uh, have a tremendous impact on your TPS status, but don't do it because it's not not good for you overall. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, well, don't forget the phone number is two one six two seven nine three nine eight four. The attorneys in the office have a lot of experience. As you have noticed, the attorney Margaret W. Wong uh, has been working for over 46 years in the immigration field. And the attorney Robert, uh, we are talking with today, he has been an immigration judge, but also has a lot of experience. I don't know how many years, but I know it's uh, over 20 and maybe over 30. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but he has been there for uh, some, some good time <laughs> uh, we need to learn a lot from him and the experience of working as an immigration judge. Uh, is, is there a case that you may remember as a particular thing or or you saw so many cases that they look all the same for you? Well, you know, it's it, it's an interesting experience being an immigration judge. And uh, um I worked in a detained docket, so we've seen a lot of people that were detained and uh, and had to go through their cases that way. So, you know, a lot of people that are trying to seek bond and a lot of people that uh, were trying to present their case in a uh, pro se status, which means basically they, they did it on, them, on, on their own. Um, the one thing you do learn very, very quickly is that if you are in immigration proceedings and you are trying to do it on your own, it's difficult. It's going to be very, very difficult for you. It's difficult to gather the documents you need. It's difficult to gather the proof that you need to support your case. It's difficult to even know what you should be telling the judge um, to, to help support your case. And, you know, in the, in the, in the detained docket situation, immigration judges see a lot of people that just, they don't have attorneys. They, they either can't afford attorneys or they don't know attorneys in the United States, or they may not have family that can help them with attorneys. Uh, and, and that does not work out well. Um, so if you are, if you do find yourself in immigration proceedings, it's in your best interest to be represented, certainly. Yes, and uh, some attorneys in the past did those like verbatim or verbatim um, asylum applications. And mm. the, the purpose was to put people in removal proceedings and then fight for the cancellation of removal. And many people got in trouble just because of that, because they didn't have a good attorney. And that's uh, what we are suggesting some people right now. If you don't have an asylum case, please don't file because you're going to have a removal order and you may be deported because the defense has become a little tough, uh, more tough than before because so many people have used this uh, process just to get a work permit. And the good thing is that in the office that uh, we are, with the attorney Margaret W. Wong and all of the attorneys, uh, we take care of all of these cases, and we are very careful to not put people in trouble in the future, because some people just want the work permit now, and don't, they don't care what's going to happen in two, five, six years. So uh, this is one of the things that we see a lot. Uh, we have more questions in our Facebook Live. So this next one is, uh, is there a way that a 65-year-old person can do citizenship in Spanish only with seven years of green card? You can't do the citizenship test in Spanish, but you can get waivers for the language once you reach a certain age. And I have to go back and look. I think it's 72. Um, so, uh, but there is waivers for, for it. Um, there can be waivers not, not only based on age, but other conditions that, you know, may prevent, uh, uh, may create a language barrier. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, go come in, talk with an attorney. Uh, 
you know, review the specifics of your case because there may be some specific uh, eligibility that, that may allow you to waive some of the English requirements for the citizenship test. So um, it, is, it is possible and you do reach a certain age where they, they waive that, but uh, uh, it just really depends on every individual case. Okay, thank you so much. I think there's a, an age combination, but uh, I don't know if this person matches. Uh, I think it's um, 60 years old and 10 years of green card or 55 years old and 15 years of green card to do it in, uh, in, in Spanish or in your language. Uh, but in this case, this person doesn't have the 10 years right. uh, with a green card. So probably a, a, another exception. Um, just please give us a call and the phone number is... 216-279-3984 and the attorneys will help you out to find uh, an answer for your question. Uh, the next question is on our inbox and this person says, I need help um, for my mom. Uh, let me just find the comment here. I, I am, she's in removal process but she doesn't have a decision yet. Uh, do I qualify for five years on my work permit if I am in removal process or this kind of permit doesn't qualify? Okay, so that's a question about something that I think is is still uh, undecided. The, uh, the government had announced that they were considering changing the work authorization to a five-year work authorization to help eliminate the backlog in applying for work authorizations while people are in proceedings. Currently, you can either get a one or a two year work authorization and you have to reapply as that expires. The problem with the two year work authorization right now is it takes 18 months to get, a, to get it approved. So uh, that creates a problem. So the government had announced that they were, they were contemplating the five year work authorization. That's not uh, definitive yet um, and that may come into play. So uh, if you are in proceedings right now and you need to renew your work authorization, you should go ahead and do so. Uh, you may end up with a five-year work authorization or you may end up back with the two-year or one-year, whatever you had previous. But um, uh, the, the best time to do that is you know, with, before it expires so that you take advantage of that uh, and you don't have any gaps in your work authorization. Now, while you're in proceedings and you're uh, waiting for the judge, either to make a decision or that you're just waiting for your trial date, uh, you get to keep renewing that work authorization and it will depend what they do in the future as to whether you get that two or five year work authorization. Okay, thank you so much, attorney. And uh, we have Sandra that said uh, she needs help, but we are waiting for your question, Sandra. Uh, so if you don't mind, can you write it down and we are gonna be happy to answer your question live uh, today with the attorney Robert Ratliff. Um, the next question is my mother's, okay, we have the, the Sandra question. Let's answer this first and then we go with you. And my mother's valid tourist visa was canceled when she was prevented from boarding her flight from India to the United States this year. This happened due to an error in the airlines records only indicating that an um, overstay during her previous visit. Despite correcting this mistake with U.S. border and customs upon her arrival last year, her visa remains revoked. How can we expedite the reinstatement of her visa considering that she was wrongfully affected by an airline error last year? This is, cause, this is causing uh, significant... Uh, problem i guess yeah yeah so the the only way to get that fixed is really through um uh, the state department so there is a state department expedited request uh availability to to request a new visa you can show them that you know what what the errors were they can review the uh, process so so there is a, a process to do that if she is currently in india she could do that uh, by making an appointment at uh, at the nearest embassy uh, that might be the best way to do it. So you can talk to a person in play in in face to face, but there is also a, an expedited request that you can make through the U.S. State Department for those visas. 
Okay, thank you so much. And yeah, the last part of the question is, uh, this has caused uh, significant inconvenience and distress, especially considering her physical challenges as a wheelchair user. Mm -hmm. Uh, your advice is greatly appreciated. Yeah, yeah, and and I would just go through that State Department process. That that's going to be your best way to to get that visa as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you so much. And don't forget, you can call the phone number two one six two seven nine three nine eight four two one six two seven nine three nine eight four. Sandra has the question. They denied my case and gave me. Uh, 1601 or I-601? Yeah, 601. Yeah, because I did have an expungement. Okay. Um, kind of a mixed verbs there. So um, if they deny, if you have a, an application for adjustment of status and they deny it uh, based on a prior criminal conviction, it can be even a minor conviction, an expungement doesn't, uh, do away with the conviction for immigration purposes. A lot of people think that if they get a case expunged in, in criminal court, that that means that it doesn't impact their immigration case, and that's not true. Um, even, uh, even cases where you are not convicted uh, because you participated in some sort of a court diversion program still counts as a conviction if you entered a guilty plea at any point in time. So that can be a problem uh, for someone that later wants to try to adjust status. Now, a 601, which is called I-601 waiver, is a waiver that is available to individuals who are trying to adjust status based on certain prior convictions. So if the prior conviction is one that is a waivable offense, and there are a myriad of them, uh, many, many uh, offenses that are waivable. If it is one of those offenses, then you can still adjust status and apply for uh, a and, and obtain an immigrant visa, but you have to go through that waiver process. And that is that uh, I-601 uh, application. Um, and you just need all your records from the criminal court. Now, what complicates these I-601 uh, applications is a lot of times people get expungements and it may be an expungement from five or 10 years ago. And when they get that expungement, the local court where the expungement occurred just destroys the files because they, for their perspective, the criminal case is expunged, it's done with, and they destroy everything. So now you're in immigration proceedings and you're trying to show what was the type of conviction I received, uh, that it wasn't something that should be disqualifying, that it wasn't uh, as serious as immigration court alleges, uh, but now you have no records because you got the expungement. So it, it complicates your ability to uh, obtain those, those waivers, uh, and the expungement can sometimes make the, uh, the, the situation worse for you. So it, it's, it's very complicated. You're definitely going to need to navigate that, navigate that both in the local criminal court and with the immigration court. And that takes uh, really experienced uh, counsel to, to help you do that. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Robert. And we have time for one more question today. And this one says, I came on H-2A visa and my employer didn't do what he offered. I resigned and got unemployed. It was two years ago. I was told about T visa, but can I still apply now two years later? And how do I prove it? Because I went to the labor department and they said it couldn't help me because I don't have a social. The short answer is yes. The two years doesn't matter so much for the T visa. Um, the more difficult answer is qualifying for the T visa. Uh, an economic based T visa application, which is one based on employment and fraudulent employment, uh, fraudulent inducement into the country, or even uh, situations where you're uh, essentially an indentured servant to an employer, uh, those require a lot of showing. So you're gonna need uh, the records, uh, make sure you've kept any communications with the, that former employer, emails, text messages, uh, anything to prove that, you know, what, what the offer was, how, why it was terminated um, and, and all those things. So it, it is possible that you can uh, qualify for the T visa, but it's, it's a very high burden and it's a very high standard in these employment-based T visa applications. 
Yeah, and it looks like uh, the payment was bad, and it, they were living in a very, very bad condition, sleeping yeah. on the floor, and it was full of cockroaches and rats. Yeah, we see that uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of H two A visas. You see that sometimes in J one visas. Uh, college kids that come here thinking they're getting training, and they end up, you know, in, in situations like this. So it it is common, um, and I think the reason it's that's one of the reasons why the standard is is difficult to meet is because of how common this 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 kind of abuses are. Okay, thank you so much, attorney. Our time is up for today. Thank you very much for sharing your lo your knowledge and your answers. Um, I'm sure that you have a lot of experience and. Uh, we we'll learn a lot from you when we have the chance to talk. Uh, you don't get the chance to talk to a former judge uh, every day. So thank you so much for sharing your time. And uh, I hope that you have you have a good lunch and good rest of the day. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. Good seeing you again. Thank you very much. And don't forget, you can call the phone number 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 is the office of Margaret W. Woman Associates with over 46 years of experience, plus the experience that all the attorneys uh, add to the law firm, like the attorney Robert Ratliff, uh, with a lot of experience, not only as an attorney, but also as an immigration judge. And you can talk to them. You can just call the phone number 216 2793984. And there are some processes that you cannot do if you don't have an attorney or you need an attorney. You may attend to a court hearing without an attorney, but that's going to be a big problem. And maybe you, you will not have the words to defend yourself. So you need a good attorney to represent you in court, especially in some cases that are more complicated. You need a good attorney and you can find it in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong. The phone number is 216 Two seven nine three nine eight four two one six two seven nine three nine eight four. Have a good day. Thank you so much for joining us today in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong Associates. Mm -hmm.